Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Tony Miracker. I'm the section chair for Simply Toronto. And uh, welcome to uh, this evening's meeting. And uh, before I uh, get off this slide and move on to our slide deck, uh, the board would like to wish everybody uh, and their families health, happiness, and the joy of this holiday season. Um, yeah, so let's uh, we'll get the show going. If I can get the slide deck to change, there we go. Yes, you are uh, on the Simply Toronto um, meeting, just in case you thought it was something else. Um, the sponsor for tonight is the Toronto Technical Conference, TTC as we uh, know it for short. And um, it will be in June 2021. It will be virtual because uh, we all think that face-to-face -face is not going to be happening uh, when June rolls around. So uh, we're working on that right now. So uh, stay tuned and there'll be more information coming as uh, time moves on. So this evening's meeting is um, a 2020 SMPTE Fall Conference Wrap-Up. It's uh, the conference that uh, uh, was uh, November, I think, 10th, 11th, and 12th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we're going to hear from Barbara Lang this evening. We're going to hear from Felix Poulon, uh, Jeff Moore, uh, Jim Morrison, and also Paul Chapman. So, um, so more on that. Uh, tonight, I'm your moderator, and I will be at the controls, so I'll be moving uh, things around and giving people access uh, for the presentation. Uh, Sylvia, as a co-organizer, and Craig, as a co-organizer, will also uh, be helping me out as well. Sylvia will be introducing and reading the bios for all the presenters, and Craig will be manning, uh, managing the question and chat room. And on that point, um, questions will be held at the end, and um, so hold all your questions. And there's two ways to get a hold of Craig. You can either uh, type in the chat box that you have a question and or you can actually uh, say you've got a question. Sorry, you can put your question in the chat box and Craig will read it. Or if you add that you have a question, then Craig will spark up your mic and you can add, add your comments or questions uh, live. Um, so what I want to do is uh, take a couple of minutes and just review where uh, sec the Toronto section, uh, what we did in 2020. Uh, it's interesting when you look back on uh, things that, that we've done. Uh, the January meeting was leveraging blockchain into the media supply chain. Um, we had 47 people attend that particular uh, meeting. We had representation from Grey Matter. Uh, Chai Long and also uh, Bernard from PBS. It was actually a, a very great meeting, meeting an eye opener. Uh, in February, we did something a little different. We uh, had a focused uh, meeting on students. So we were targeting the student audience. We had 110 people, mostly students, uh, come to that event. And we had topics, uh, I think that we had eight presenters, so we had a roster. Um, I talked about SMPTE, Peter talked about color theory, uh, David talked about standards and charting, and, and the list goes on and on. It, um, uh, we talked about AI, we talked about uh, virtual studios, uh, immersive studios, and um, it, was, it was a great meeting. Um, and we had more questions on AI from students. So it was interesting to, to hear their take. Mary Ellen, we had her as well from Dome Productions, who talked, or she talked about the future broadcast, uh, more in the slant uh, for the uh, female side. And it was actually quite interesting. And um, the audience was all ears. Now we jump from February to May because uh, lo and behold, that's when uh, COVID hit. So we had to cancel both uh, March and April's meeting. And May happened to be our first virtual meeting. So uh, we 
uh, learned a lot since then, but um, we had 82 attendees. So obviously we're starting to do something right. Um, of interest, uh, Francois, um, is if you see the right top uh, slide or picture, um, it's an LED Christmas tree. So um, his caption was, it was my third attempt building a 2110 compatible Christmas tree. And the interesting thing there, he had his kids involved. His kids were soldering, they were coding. So it was definitely a family uh, event. Uh, I didn't show a picture of it lit, but it does light with many, many colors. In June, we did one on uh, 5G technology. Again, it, um, it was an interesting topic. Um, we had, uh, we had uh, Michael, uh, Craig, uh, and Sion front, and Tony Jones, actually. Tony came to us from uh, England, and what we noticed was um, we were now able to tap into uh, more speakers, and um, distance didn't seem to be the uh, issue uh, other than time zones. Uh, Tony was at, I think it was 1 o'clock in the morning or 1.30 in the morning for him, so um, it definitely... Uh, uh, worked out, and we had a hundred people show up at that event. So, uh, so it was pretty, pretty cool. Um, uh, next, and that again, this is a slide that told us that uh, um, we canceled our technical conference for 2020. Um, a couple of reasons: one, a, we were in COVID; b, our venue closed its doors, so we had no place to uh, hold it. And c, it was way, way too early in the whole virtual space for us to try and figure out how do you do a conference um, in such short order when we were just trying to figure out how to do it just on a on a meeting perspective. So, uh, and hence our tonight's meeting, we will hear from the various. Uh, presenters and we'll all hopefully learn more about uh, uh, the uh, in putting on one of these uh, virtual uh, events. Uh, skip ahead to September. Uh, again, this is when um, everything from working from home and um, remote production started to play out and we thought we'd uh, capture some of that and just share with our members and, and attendees to the uh, the meeting as to how everybody is doing it. So we had uh, uh, Brian uh, talk about the remote uh, at home side of it. Uh, Michael talked about the, the production, post-production side of it. And uh, Sasha talked about the production side of it. And it was again, uh, an interesting uh, uh, conversation as to how all this was happening, and it was happening. It was working, um, so that worked out really well. And there were 66 people that uh, attended that event. October was a big one. It's the biggest one for us so far. We had 140 people attend this particular event. And, and just to give you an idea, when we were doing face-to-face, -face, we had 45 to 55 people on average. So uh, this is definitely telling us that the virtual side is working. So uh, if face-to-face uh, -face ever comes back, we will definitely need to keep the uh, virtual component uh, of this uh, so that the uh, rest of the, uh, the masses out there can uh, uh, listen in and learn while we are as well. So this happened to be on IP audio and in the broadcast world, and we did this as a joint venture with our uh, sec, or sorry, our partners, uh, AES, Audio Engineering Society of Toronto. So uh, that worked. Our next one was live production uh, forecast, cloudy for the foreseeable future. Again, we had uh, Peter uh, working from. Uh, he's the membership uh, vice president, I believe it is, uh, from Simply Home Office, but he also is um, involved with the Washington section. 
So we had AWS, and uh, again, uh, Jean de Baptiste um, was from uh, from uh, uh, Paris, if I'm not mistaken. And here we had 77 people. So, you know, the general theme is that the numbers are to suggest that we are definitely, uh, you know, uh, focusing on uh, making this available to people in the virtual space. I throw this in because this happened to be our December 2019 um, meeting. This is what face-to-face -face and gatherings looked like. If anybody has forgotten what simply meetings can look like or have looked like. Um, um, so the bottom right-hand corner, this is an interesting uh, uh, scenario where we have um, a number of people that we know have registered. We tell that to the caterers, but we upchuck it a bit because sometimes people show up um, last minute. At the same time, the caterers upchucked it a bit as well. And um, so the bottom right picture is the amount of food that was left over. So there was a lot of food left over and, and none of it went to waste. We actually filled uh, Blue Ant Media's fridges, and I think they fed the staff for two days afterwards. So it was definitely uh, a great, great, uh, great event. But again, what face-to-face uh, -face, uh, and in-person is all about. Um, this slide here talks about Humber College. Um, uh, Humber College has started a lab or is in the process of starting a lab. Uh, we have been working with them, uh, ATSC3, um, as for a couple of things. One is uh, the initiative of the lab, where we think that um, our SIMTI members can learn a bit. So we are uh, looking at March as being a potential meeting to introduce uh, that as a meeting topic. And we're also excited about getting the uh, students at Humber College involved in SIMTI as well. So that would be a new initiative for the Toronto section. And we're also talking about having a student chapter in their uh, uh, institution in uh, uh, Humber College. Uh, this slide here uh, just shows you um, the numbers as to uh, where we stand as membership uh, numbers uh, in the section, uh, the Toronto section. We didn't do too bad. We have, uh, you know, we have dropped, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 42 people. Um, in uh, if you look at the current from January to today, uh, sorry, it would have been uh, before the uh, latest numbers that came out uh, yesterday. So this would be October numbers. So uh, all in all, I don't think that we've uh, done too bad. We haven't lost a lot of people to the COVID uh, situation. So uh, uh, that's a good thing. But uh, just to remind everybody that um, we will in January be starting a campaign of people that are have um, actually expired or they have uh, let their membership last. So we're just gonna give you a reminder email uh, just to say, hey, this is us. This is what. Uh, just to remind you that you you have uh, your membership has lapsed. So uh, just give you a heads up on that. Um, and then uh, more exciting news is that uh, we have two fellows that um, the Canadian version of uh, the people that have joined the ranks of uh, Simpty fellow members. Uh, at the fall conference this uh, past month or uh, in the past month uh, in November. Mike Johnson or Michael Johnson and Felix Ballou have both been awarded uh, fellowship status with uh, SEMTI. So um, this is great uh, that we have two Canadians uh, uh, into the uh, roster of uh, well-appointed people. So that's it for the SEMTI Toronto um, update. Um, and that's we're going to spin right into the conference. I got a few slides here just to uh, give you. Um, most of you uh, have seen this if you've attended. If you had not attended uh, the fall conference, 
this is what you would have been presented with. It gives you the uh, kind of the the foyer of uh, of the uh, event, and there are various places that you go to, whether it be uh, into the exhibit halls, whether it's uh, sessions. Uh, there's a whole slew of things. If you look at the left hand side, the uh, list of things that you could get into you could review speakers you could connect with connect with attendees there's uh, a, a myriad of things that you could do uh, this was the uh, the session foyer where you actually went to various sessions whether they be technical whether they be anything on demand so it gave you a lot of uh, places to uh, go virtually uh, there's also here a, a sponsor showcase where uh, sponsors had a opportunity to um, present their uh, videos and things of that nature. Um, next was the there was an exhibit hall. There happened to be four of them, where um, various it's like the normal face-to-face uh, -face, uh, mini NEB, but. Uh, Simti has done that at the fall conference where they had uh, kiosks and various uh, um, manufacturers lined up and people could actually go and see the product that was uh, uh, being demonstrated. Um, I'm just drilling down into uh, this, uh, the hall B or D, sorry, and you can see the various people or the organizations, uh, companies that happen to be in hall uh, D. And all others of the three had various ones. I think they were in alphabetical order, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is just drilling into uh, Ross's um, uh, portal. Uh, you can see um, there's a little video that you can play. Uh, play. There are support documents. There happen to be uh, uh, salespeople. You could actually schedule a meeting with them. There was an open chat, so it gave Man, uh, manufacturers and suppliers uh, uh, ways of communicating to the people that were attending the event. Uh, there are also um, videos that um, were uh, we could watch after the fact, but there were two days uh, of gala. This happened to be part two, so this was day two. And then Barbara introduced, and there was the uh, the whole uh, award ceremony. Uh, very, very nicely uh, put together. So this is uh, where I hand over to uh, Sylvia, and she's going to introduce Barbara. Barbara Lang is our first presenter, and I'm going to put up the bio and uh, take it away. So, yeah. All right, good evening. So Barbara Lang joined Simti as an executive director in January 2010. Founded in 1916, Simti is the global professional association that supports the technical framework and professional community, which makes quality motion imaging available to consumers in a variety of media formats. Ms. Lang's portfolio includes participating in and ex executing on the Simti Board of Governors strategic vision and to ensure the society's continued relevance in an ever evolving global media technology ecosystem. Under Ms. Lang's leadership, membership has grown by more than 30%. More than 200 leading edge industry standards have been published, including industry game changers such as IMF, HDR, and video over IP. And the society has educated thousands of professionals on critical technical topics. Today, Ms. Lang's focus is implementing a three-year strategic business plan that will further Simti's visibility and relevance with an emphasis on attracting a younger and more diverse membership demographic. As part of this effort, in 2020, the society launched a brand new image and website. In 2015, Ms. Lang led the acquisition of the HPA, Hollywood Professional Association, a leading trade association uh, focused on the application of technology in the creation, distribution, and consumption of professional media content. 
Ms. Lang holds a BA in Chemistry and German from Washington and Jefferson College in Washington, PA, and completed the Executive Development Program at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Prior to joining SIMTI, she held executive roles in scholarly publishing at highly respected organizations, including Springer Verlag and the IEEE, the world's largest technical professional association. Ms. Lang has been recognized for her leadership by Washington and Jefferson College, the IEEE, and honored with TV News Check 2020 Woman in Technology Award for her role in making a difference in the media industry. All yours, Barbara. Okay, Barbara, I'm going to give you a presentation control, but you are also muted. So if you can unmute yourself, and I'm going to make you presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Let's get this uh, up. I hope you can see that okay. Well, uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. I'm sorry I can't enjoy all that food uh, that would have uh, happened if we were all together uh, in, in one physical space. But I'm really uh, pleased to be here and happy to talk a little bit about our experience around the conference. And I also want to talk a little bit about um, some ongoing SIMPTE planning for the future. Um, so with that, I, uh, Tony did already show you uh, the, walked you through a little bit of our interface with the conference this year. And, um, but these are some of the other um, items of note that is uh, the content that we delivered and all the things that we did. When, when we realized that we had to go to a virtual environment, um, it was, I want to say, April early May. So we had about six months to find a platform, figure out, you know, how to how to price it, how to arrange the content, how to think about this as a truly global SIMPTE experience. And that is one of the, there are a few benefits of a virtual environment. Tony pointed it out in his notes regarding the success of your virtual section meetings. Well, the same is true for many virtual conferences. You are able to attract um, a large audience and I'll show you in a minute some of our our uh, results from the event but just to give you a sense of what we did and and it was three days November 10th 11th and 12th we had um, seven keynotes we had two major keynotes and then we had what were called five mini keynotes um, and we had a diverse uh, a group of people, uh, not just gender, but in terms of the kinds of, of topics that they were covering. Um, so we had creative, we had technical, we had a cinematographer, and of course, Michelle Munson, who is, is doing such amazing things um, and is always a, a, a great person to listen to. We had a smaller technical program than usual. Normally, we would probably have about 70 papers, so we had 34, so uh, about half as many. Many, but then we also filled in with um, much um, other content uh, related to standards, related to executives. Um, we, of course, partnered with our colleagues at the HPA, the Women in Post. They always um, hold a, uh, a, a luncheon with the speaker. We did that virtually. We invited our friends from the AES back, and we also, this year for the first time, did a, a few sessions on agile project management with PMI. We continued, we added poster sessions, which was new. We added a, a, a thing called core concept, which was allowing people to get a taste of what the topic would be uh, coming later in the day. Uh, we instituted a new a program called Ask a Simply Expert. So people volunteered to say, I'm an expert in XYZ, and I would be happy to speak with you about it so that we could try to increase networking. Um, we also had sponsored content and we also delivered content specifically to the APAC region. Again, with a virtual environment, you can, you can have a lot more flexibility in delivering content to all parts of the world. Um, and in fact, the AK Association was a big player in that where we delivered content that was more convenient for our colleagues in Asia who often um, have to wake up in the middle of the night to attend any kind of uh, SIMPTE meetings. So we were time zone friendly. We also um, introduced a new pricing option where we had uh, variable pricing for people coming from 
um, low-income countries. We had a pay it for, forward model where uh, people who had the means could pay a little extra so that it would support uh, people who were paying less. Um, we had an exhibition hall, as uh, Tony showed you, with uh, over 70 exhibitors and partners, and it's 24-hour access because there's no, as long as there's somebody who wants to make an appointment and there's a convenient time, you could be accessible all the time. And of course, we had our awards gala as well. Um, top it off, we uh, had our uh, pr uh, theme of the conference was game on esports. So we had a full day of esports content and it ended with an esports exhibition match with a professional team called Team Liquid from the Netherlands and students at RIT in Rochester, not far from where you are. So it was an amazing three days. Um, not much sleep for us, but uh, we learned we learned learned a lot, and um, it was an amazing thing to put together in just a short amount of time. So a little bit about the data. Um, so just to give you a sense, a normal, um, well, actually, I think I have data coming up that shows you normal, but 531 people took the all access um, and 45 of them, um, or in addition, 45 did the pay it forward model. And so they were helping to subsidize effectively students, um, educators, and those coming from developing nations, as well as 15 hardship requests. So we really were very pleased by uh, SIMPTI community stepping up and helping those in need. Um, and we were very happy with the, the, with the registration figures. Um, normally, a conference uh, does um, deliver about four to 600 people, so we were right there in the sweet spot. The exhibition, and I'll talk about that a little, well, no, I'll talk about it right now. The exhibition, uh, you know, virtual doesn't work perfectly great for exhibitions. It's not, um, you know, the platforms are not um, conducive to um, serendipity in, in a virtual environment. You have to make an effort to click on somebody's booth, and we know that that was uh, problematic for some people, but we wanted to give it a try, and um, I would expect in over the years as virtual platforms get better, the exhibition experience will also improve, so we're, um, we're looking forward to that. But there's a statistic right there. In 2019, we had 414 all access versus the 576. So I, we were very pleased with that um, kind of turnout. Statistically, um, who comes? Well, it's pretty clear. Our members, uh, most of the people who attend are SIMPTI members. Um, I think the, the um, it doesn't show here, but our total number of registrants was around 1,300. So those are all the people, if you added up all those numbers from the previous slides, about 1,300. So 55% of them are members, 59% of them are white, um, about 40% of them are middle-aged, so um, and 72% seven, uh, of them are male. So this is uh, this is a classic SIMPTI conference. Um, there's nothing wrong with it at all, but if we want to attract new and different um, thinking and and um, diverse perspectives, then obviously we want to work on increasing our diversity. So. The good news is we do hit our core and they supported this event um, fully. The, the number I find here that's interesting is also the 120 Asian people because again, we were really uh, working hard to, to deliver some content for the um, APAC region and, and I think that's um, uh, the result of that. Um, so, and who are the typical attendees in terms of where they fall in terms of their their jobs? Well, we um, have kind of we we cover both ends of the spectrum, I think, pretty well. Um, in in having, we always have some C level people, which is not um, unsurprising. Um, the, the, to attend the conference in person at the physical event is not inexpensive, so naturally that would be more for senior level people. Um, but the good news here is that we were able to also attract um, 
you know, the um, the engineers, the, the you know, the classic SIMPTI member who probably couldn't come to uh, uh, an in-person event as we normally would have done. So we're very happy with that. Um, one area that we're struggling with, and that is the early career professional. That is, uh, that demographic is really hard to maintain. We have a lot of students um, on any given year, pre-COVID at least, a lot of students, and then when they enter into the workforce, they forget about SIMPTI or any professional association. I don't think that's unique to us. And so bringing them back um, is, is something that we want to focus on because those are the people that A, could use the networking um, uh, advantages that SIMPTI brings, also the education, and we have to work harder to appeal to that audience. So that is an area that we um, struggle with. Students and educators were really happy that we were able to see some decent numbers from that sector. Love to see more, by the way. Um, we actually offered our um, education advisors uh, free access this year, um, and students, I think it was only $10, so it was pretty inexpensive. And um, we saw upticks in numbers, but they're quite small, and we'd love to see them um, increase. So, um, in terms of where they find themselves in the world. Um, so this shows you the kinds of industries that they uh, fall into. Uh, broadcast is, is uh, pretty typical. Um, in LA, you would have seen also um, studio, more studio people. Um, we're seeing nice figures in, in things like software developer. That's a, that's a decent, decent number. Post-production, even though it, it um, it uh, looks like it's come down um, is still a pretty, you know, a pretty decent number. Of course, our manufacturer suppliers, they're the ones supporting the exhibition. We're happy with the gaming number. It was a conference that we wanted to kind of target gaming. Of course, a very small number, but at least an increase over uh, previous years. And, and I already mentioned the um, educators. So we're trying to track all this data on a regular basis so that we can measure ourselves, see how we can adjust and shift. And it also does help us in terms of what kinds of um, uh, content we want to develop and that sort of thing. Um, just in terms of overall uh, registration, um, these are figures that um, first timers, we, we mentioned that I think in, in a recent post that we did, 47% uh, as first timers compared to 30% last year. That's tremendous. That's uh, Those are great leads of people who um, are first time experiencing SIMPTI, learning about it, um, hopefully getting a lot out of it. Um, we were very pleased with our global reach, 49 countries represented. Again, the virtualness of this makes that um, a much uh, easier target to, it, to, to look at than you would in a, in a, um, in a physical space. Um, how did you hear about SIMPTI 2020 as a conference? Um, you know, email is the number one uh, mechanism. We all hate to get all those emails, but honestly, it does work. Um, Word of mouth happens to work pretty well also, but definitely email. And you'll notice um, the last statistic there on the bottom, the timing of registration. Um, this was a nail biter. It was uh, a nail biter from the time we made the decision until the day uh, we opened the doors because it's very difficult to assess how many people are actually going to attend. And um, with this world of so many competitive events out there, many of them free, we were really worried, um, I'm not going to lie, up until the very end. But you can see 71% of people registered in the last two weeks. Um, and that was then an avalanche. Um, but it was uh, it was definitely something that uh, we're learning, uh, working with, we have to work with the speakers, the exhibitors, the sponsors, and everybody, including ourselves, to really communicate, communicate, communicate. And um, Hope that uh, people don't wait until the last minute to um, to uh, to register. Procrastinators, we're all procrastinators. Um, and the reach and the impact, we we were very happy with the. Uh, we did a lot of posting of social media, much more than we've done in the past, um, between social posts and e-blasts and press releases and tra video trailers. These are the two video trailers that we did, um, and our various uh, media campaigns that were out there. Um, so we had 4.1 million unique social media accounts reached. Um, I I I'm. 
honestly, that's like Greek to me sometimes, but um, I'm told it's a very good figure. So um, I'm pleased by that. And I'm also pleased by the next figure. Uh, and also because people paid, they're going to come. But the trend is that people register and sad to say, um, oftentimes you see only an attendance of 15 to 54%. So by having 84% of people actually participating, um, you know, paying to attend and then actually attending, I think um, is very pleased and uh, to see. Final outcome, we um, we had a pop-up uh, gift shop. Uh, I mentioned that and we thank our, our sponsors, NTC, for their support. Um, normally, NTC would have uh, sponsored the bag, right? Uh, but there is no bag in a virtual world. So we thought of, well, what kind of uh, gifts can we give um, instead? And we thought, well, we'll give Simpy gifts. And sure enough, we I think we've given out over, I think Sally told me this afternoon, about uh, almost 300 um, gifts, and they're all Simpy gifts. So they're either membership, they're discounts on the conference, they're collections of packages of content, either um, standards or um, uh, conference content, and people want it, and we're very grateful to have it. So I think it goes to show you that um, there is uh, a lot of, of very good interest in SIMPTI, and I, I noticed in, Tony, your remarks about your membership, um, that is uh, very good too. Um, and lastly, uh, the event, the other thing about virtual, at least with the platform that we have, is that the event doesn't uh, close right away. So we actually extended access to the end of the year, um, and that means people can still go on. If you have a registration and you forgot, well, you can still go on. You have two more weeks or so. Um, I don't know what you're doing on New Year's Eve. Maybe you want to go download all your uh, um, uh, catch up on the sessions and such. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the other thing of, of the virtual of platform that we use is that we could extend access um, for practically um, almost six weeks after the event. Um, and that goes for exhibitors as well, so you can visit exhibitors. You can't really make appointments with them, but you can certainly visit uh, their booths, download their content, view their videos and all that um, as if you were literally there. So we, we learned a ton in the whole process. We learned that uh, there's still a long road to go in terms of making a virtual event, ex you know, the, the networking and the and that human contact obviously is missing. But there are advantages to a uh, virtual and that is you, you a much broader reach to uh, the audience that you want to achieve. So um, we'll take that and, and learn on it and see what happens next year. Um, so with that, I'm going to shift gears slightly to talk just a little bit about what does uh, 2021 look like. Um, this is a very high level, and um, I'm happy to come back another time to dive deeper into this if you like. But, um, you know, we, we uh, like many organizations in the world, we are impacted by the pandemic. Uh, thankfully, SIMPTI is a strong organization, strong financially, has a very strong network of members members. You are all witness to that in participating in this event. But um, the impact that the industry is going through um, does uh, contact us. So firstly, the cancellation of all the industry events. Simpty is a shareholder of the IBC. It's a major contributor to our revenue income. That cancellation was hard. Um, it forced us to do, well, we would have done things uh, differently anyway, but we had to make some very serious um, decisions around um, expense cutting and, and all sorts of things. Um, membership, uh, while it has been impacted, as Tony pointed out, in, in Toronto, your membership is, is not so bad uh, considering, and I'm pleased to report that our membership numbers are, um, are certainly down, but they're down less than sort of the, in, the association industry of, of 30 to 50 percent. We're less than 30 percent. We're, we're right now um, through the middle of December for the year at about 20 percent, and, and um, we feel there are a few outstanding corporate members who should be coming in before the end of the year. So we think we'll be at about 15 percent down and um, that's actually pretty phenomenal in a year of, of hours of this type and the industry going through such a major shift. And it does show the um, 
the reliance that the industry has on on SMPD. Um, one of the other things that we continue to do, though, was to reimagine SMPD for a brighter future. This logo, the, the website, these are things that the board decided we still had to do. We were on the path to doing them. Um, we we um, focused attention on that, and I'm so delighted to see the new logo uh, with your Toronto uh, name underneath and all the other sections around the world. It's really a very dynamic logo that really uh, talks to our um, refocus on, on the being a place for all media professionals, technologists, and engineers. And we're beginning to rethink our business models. Um, we've been living in an environment that frankly, for the 100 and almost five years has served us very well in how we have a membership model and we do standards and things of that sort. Um, but now the board recognizes that things are not going to be the same in the future. Um, millennials or the young people you know, joining organizations like a professional association is is maybe not so natural to do. There's other ways for people to get information. So we do have to rethink our business models and we're actively pursuing that. So there's no moss growing under our toes um, and we're actively doing these things. Um, of course, you saw uh, just briefly mentioning the logo in the new website, and this is just the beginning of um, more work that um, we're uh, working on. And speaking of which, new areas of interest that um, the board is looking at in the new year, firstly, media in the cloud. Um, you'll hear a lot more from Simpty about that. Um, all the things that happened this year to move uh, media into the cloud at a more robust and accelerated rate is uh, areas that Simpty is absolutely qualified in and um, should be having a much more participatory role, particularly in standards and interoperability needs. Another one that um, uh, was an outcropping from the conference was this whole notion of esports and that uh, esports uh, is, is really in some ways built on the backbone of a combination of broadcast and OTT and um, and a lot of uh, pro AV kinds of, of, of uh, con uh, technology. And we think there's a place where Simpty could um, actively have a role. It's a very nascent industry. It has a lot of um, very specific technical needs and um, we think that there's a, a place where Simpty can play. And then finally um, is the pro AV space. Pro AV is a is a, a giant industry compared to the traditional broadcast media space that uh, Simpty finds itself, and we think there are some opportunities there. Um, uh, again, leading with interoperability, but uh, perhaps uh, increasing with membership and and other um, educational activities. So those are areas of interest. If you're interested, the board is always welcome to um, have your input and your participation. Um, so please let us uh, know. Um, and finally, I'll close with the new administration um, takes office as of January. So our good friend Pat uh, Griffiths will turn into the Pat uh, the past Prez. Um, he refers to himself as Pez, Prez Pat, so now he will be past Prez. Pat and say that three times. Hans Hoffman is our new incoming president as of January. He is uh, the first um, European that uh, is sitting in that seat and we're very excited to be working with him. Pat uh, Hans is um, of the EBU. Um, and I wanted to point out that we have some diversity on our um, executive committee. Patricia Keeley, not only is she a woman, but she's also a Canadian. So I'm really uh, um, happy to be working with uh, Patricia in her role as executive vice president. She is uh, her remit is really around strategic planning and and um, all of that kind of forward looking activity. And next um, in the uh, administration, we have Bruce Devlin, who continues in his role as standards VP, and we have another Canadian, Paul Steckley, who I see is on the uh, in the in the house today, so to speak. So Paul is um, graciously stepping in with Patricia leaving uh, her 
term as finance VP. We uh, we asked Paul if he wouldn't mind helping out and and playing the role uh, active role of finance VP again. So we welcome him. Uh, Mike Zink, uh, Warner Media from the Hollywood side, will be our new education VP. We're excited with his um, uh, knowledge, uh, spe especially his connection to the Hollywood community. And Renard Jenkins, um, who happens also to be with Warner Media, but more on the television side. Um, you mentioned uh, he spoke at your event earlier this year. He's joining us as membership VP, and I know he has a lot of interest in um, sp uh, many things, including um, uh, diversity issues. And John Furter continues in his role as Secretary Treasurer. Um, and with that, I thank you very much. I'm sorry if I took up a little bit more time. I did also want to acknowledge um, Felix on the panel here today and congratulate him on his fellowship and Mike Johnson, I saw him um, on the list, and also John Ross, who was recognized as honorary member of SIMPTI at this year's gala. So Canadians are um, showing their um, uh, presence among the SIMPTI community and we're so grateful to have you and I look forward to working with you um, more so in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks, Barbara. Um, oh, I gotta share my screen again. I do that correctly. There we go. So uh, yes, thank you, Barbara. And yeah, I forgot about John Ross and bringing him into the fold. My goodness. <laughs> uh, so apologies to uh, to John on that one. So um, yes. Yeah, so next up is uh, Felix and uh, Roberta. Sorry, Roberta. Got the wrong person. Sylvia, can you spark up and then introduce uh, Felix? I will uh, put up his uh, bio and take it away. All right. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Barbara, for a great presentation. Felix Poulin grew up in studios and control rooms, thanks to his parents who worked in television production. He has been with our national public broadcaster, CBC Radio Canada, since 2007, where he is the Director of Media over IP, Architecture, and Lab. Before that, Glenn was a lead expert on the live IP at the European Broadcasting Union, the EBU, in Switzerland for six years. He co-chaired the joint AMWA ebu simti vff Task Force on Networked Media, JT-NM, uh, produced the yearly Network Technology Seminar and led multiple expert groups. He was part of the VRT Sandbox Live I.O. project, an early proof of concept of an all IP studio, which won multiple awards, including the prestigious IBC Innovations Award in 2016. Glenn completed his Diploma in Electrical Engineering at Montreal's Polytechnical and his final thesis at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in 2002. Pelan is an active contributor to the SIMTI, EBU, and the VSF. He co-chairs the AMWA and MOSS Steering Committee. Felix was honored with the 2020 Fellows Award at this year's SIMTI Fall Conference. Welcome, Felix, over to you. Thanks, Sylvia. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to be with you tonight. Um, I'm more often uh, in, in Toronto, uh, Semti Evans, since it's virtual. So uh, maybe that, that's the good part of it. Uh, and maybe I should stick with that habit when we get back to normal. Um, yeah, I need to remind to shorten the bio one, one, when we had stuff to it. <laughs> Starts to, to be a lot of things there. Um, uh, so we were asked, I was invited here uh, tonight with, with my uh, colleagues on the, on the panel to uh, give a, a little bit of a feedback from the, uh, the SEMTI conference, uh, that's virtual experience. Um, and um, so first of all, on the general conference experience, uh, certainly, um, the, uh, the the ability to provide a uh, abil accessibility uh, give access to more participants is a good thing. For example, usually in my team we will send one or two person at the conference in person, 
uh, but now without the, the, the cost, uh, with the travel, uh, uh, and also the time it takes uh, to, to, to go uh, over, uh, we could send just in my team uh, five, six person with me. Uh, and at the scale of the CBC, uh, there's much more people that, that can attend. So I think that's a big difference, a big benefit for, for this approach. Um, the opportunity to catch up the content that you miss, uh, especially if you remember the on-site event, you a lot of time you have to, to choose one of the tracks that are going on. A lot of time, two tracks or three tracks, you need to pick something, and sometimes you 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 would like to see all of them. So with with that approach, no problem anymore. You can uh, you can catch up uh, every presentation you you want. So it was the case on the first day. There was a lot of topic that were very interesting at the same time uh, to me. Um, the game on topic, uh, I think it's a very good thing to look at other industries. Uh, you get good ideas and it opened the minds. Uh, gaming is very uh, impressive uh, in, in terms of uh, the reach of those events and the, the technological heaviness of the uh, of the production. So I think it's a it's a good uh, thing to every year look at the different uh, side industries uh, to uh, to think about uh, these things differently. Um, other big benefits is the no jet lag. <laughs> Uh, you go home and you can. Uh, you're already home and you can. Uh, yeah, you can rest. So uh, I, I think that there's a lot of benefits. What I would have liked differently, and it's a learning experience, and hopefully we don't need to do that totally virtually in the future. Um, but let's say we we uh, we will have some more uh, experience like that in the future. Um, the fact that it's pre-recorded. For me, I felt sometimes it was harder to stay attentive and connected when you watch someone that is uh, that was pre-recorded. We are in the live industry, and we like to have, even if it's not perfect, to have this kind of uh, interaction. Um, uh, even if it's remote, I've seen other uh, other presentation where uh, with the chat, with the fact that it's live, and you. You know, you have to, you, know, you do some mistakes sometimes, and it's more natural, I think. So I, I think it, uh, maybe uh, there's there's reason for recording it. Of course, uh, you you want to 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 safeguard the, the production itself, but maybe a combination of of live and and pre-recorded would be good. Um, the fact also that the tool, uh, so there was the main website where you could go in different rooms. Uh, and and that that was very um, uh, straightforward to use uh, when, once you play a little bit with it. Um, but the fact that the Q the QA and the chat and the um, and the, the QA session afterwards were in a different tool in a Zoom, I think many times I saw we lost a part of the audience who maybe did not understand uh, that they have to do an extra step to get in the QA. Um, uh, so I think that it could be a little bit better in terms of having one unified uh, tool uh, for for all the for all the the, the features. Um, and the thing I saw in other present in other uh, conference that was maybe missing is uh, the visibility of who else is where. And and you see, okay, if I go in that room, uh, here's the other people there. And okay, I know a couple of them, so I'll stick here. I'll 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 I'll, I'll start chatting. Um, uh, now you need to enter the rooms and to take a little bit of time. So these are maybe slight improvement that can improve the uh, the overall experience. But I think ideally, when we get back to normal, and you know we, we we're really looking forward uh, is. To do a combination of both the, the live, the, the, the on-site presence, uh, where you get the full experience, you can meet people face to face and all, and and for people who cannot attend, to have the uh, the ability to uh, to watch it remotely and and on demand after the events, I think that would be a, a very great um, combination. 
In terms of, of takeaways uh, on the content of the conference, so uh, I, I really focus on a few topics here. Um, the first one is, is, is not a technical discussion, but more a philosophical discussion that, that I'm, I really like uh, to, uh, to think about is a, a presentation by Bruce Devlin, Thomas Bosmason, Mason, and Yvonne Thomas on standards, open source, or both and the, the evolution of basically how you get interoperability, that's the goal of standards, uh, by what mean you get there as an industry. Uh, that's an ongoing discussion that's not new, it's there for many years, but I think uh, it, it kind of accelerates uh, nowadays. Um, we have the due process standardization, like SEMT, a lot of the SEMT, uh, the standards of SEMTI are done using a very uh, procedural approach because it gives a very stable uh, documentation when it's done. But looking at the trend towards cloud computing, software, application platform, um, this process sometimes feels a, a little bit not up to speed um, uh, with the evolution of the technology. And there's alternative ways of getting to a similar approach. And uh, the open specification approach and the open source approach. Um, the open source approach is very interesting in the sense that once you don't really write a standard, but you write working code that's used, that's usable, and that can be used as a reference. Um, and that way um, you, you spend less time talking and arguing and more time doing and trying it out. Um, and I think for pure software uh, technology, that's a very good uh, way to do. You need, of course, to have a strong community around it. You need to have a good representation of uh, of, of, of multiple parties to, to have very um, uh, neutral um, results. I'm involved in one project that's the EBU Live IP Software Toolkit. Uh, uh, with CBC, we are contributing to that project. And it's really re rewarding um, in terms of what you, what you, um, what you, you see the results of your, your, your work right away. Um, and the kind of in-between way, and the, the SEMT is also progressing and, and doing more and more of it, is the open specification. Um, uh, the, what's in, interesting with open specification is um, you don't, it's less procedural than uh, pure standardization. Uh, and then again, with, with software development, time to market and speed to, to get results is very important. Um, and you can, before you crystallize really your specification, you have a chance to implement it and to try it in prototypes, which with a standard is more difficult. Um, uh, so uh, and I, uh, I'm, I'm part of the AMWA and MOS uh, as a co-chair of the steering committee. and. This, the approach the MY is taking is before ratifying or publishing a specification, it has been implemented in many prototypes from many different vendors, and we can already um, uh, improve the spec and also make sure it's interoperable. Um, so uh, standards are still important, I think, for things that needs very uh, solid, stable grounds. Uh, SEMT 2110, for example, is a, is a place where you want to have a very precise documentation. Um, uh, I think we need all of the three approach I mentioned. Um, and I really encourage, there's a lot of people in the room that are in that industry, and uh, I really encourage people to be part of some of those, maybe just one activity be it a standards committee or a specification activity or an open source project, uh, because uh, that's that's a great experience. You learn a lot. I learn every time there's a lot of wise people involved um, and it's really a rewarding experience because you're part of making the, the industry uh, moving forward.
so that that's good. And now that we have a chance to look at those uh, presentation now that the the period is extended, uh, maybe if you didn't if you missed this one, it's a good one. On a more technical uh, topic, um, my topic of interest in, in the conference was the move to all IP and, and to the cloud. Um, and there was a lot of content about this topic. Um, in the move to IP, I, I feel we are at a different stage this year. We have all the main building blocks in place to really do major projects. Uh, as you, you may know, in, in CBC in, in Montreal, we are uh, putting the finishes touch the finish uh, touch to the the new building uh, uh, that is based on on 2110 uh, and our colleagues in in Toronto CBC uh, uh, Toronto Broadcast Center are, are also starting put their putting their hands in in in, in those projects uh, so the bricks are there there's the EBU pyramid that that show an international consensus on the user sides of what we want in those devices and it's international consensus because it's uh, it's agreed by EBU, NABA, WBU, SEMT, VSF, AMWA, very wide consensus. And on the industry side, and, and John Mayotte from Imagine presented the roadmap of AIMS. Uh, it shows what a large part, the most part of the, of the industry is following as a direction. Uh, so there's a clear path in terms of what are the standards. We are much better placed than a few years ago than when there was many different options. Um, I think there's a there's a large um, uh, uh, consensus on the stack of technology uh, we want to uh, to to use. Uh, now that we are at this stage, it's a question of maturity. So. Everybody, the industry, the vendors are, are doing better and better products. And the user, we are learning to using it. Uh, the integrator learned to uh, do system with, with, with it. Uh, so it will take a few years, of course, to get the, the full uh, maturity there. There are a number of, of gaps to, to be filled. And there was some presentation about it. Um, Thomas Kernan from NVIDIA presented the uh, EBU, uh, the, um, the SEMT uh, activity on PTP monitoring uh, that, that is working on an upcoming uh, recommended practice. And that's very, the monitoring part is a very important part that is kind of underestimated, but that's your eyes into the system. So a thing like PTP that is relatively uh, complex uh, uh, that you need to uh, to have full control and to understand exactly if it's working well, you need a solid uh, PTP monitoring. So uh, by by filling that gap of providing a common method for the whole industry to provide monitoring, uh, we will get there. And, and PTP is not the only aspect where we need monitoring. Uh, we need to monitor everything, and there's still some works to be done there. Um, and must, uh, if you're not aware of the network uh, media open specification, uh, so that's the interoperable, um, interoperable control plane for an IP uh, system. Uh, there's a good presentation from Nextera that explains the whole uh, the whole suite. Uh, it's it, it's something you cannot avoid anymore uh, and must in a um, in a, a media over IP ecosystem. Um, and we hear more and more about uh, IPMX. So there was a presentation from David Chep, uh, Chepini from Matrox. Um, IPMX is using the same or very similar stack, so 702110 and NMOS but tailor for pro EV applications. So more plug and play, more features that are, are useful for smaller uh, uh, and, um, and uh, yeah, pro EV systems. So you can imagine all these kind of application. It can be uh, uh, conference rooms, it can be uh, paging systems. There's a lot of application that's a huge market. So that's that's interesting, and that's not just for the pro EV industry, because just as a broadcaster, the number of uh, flat panel we use for video wall, it's all HDMI interface, it's a pro AV interface. So 
Imagine if we can use the same ST2110 to feed those panels instead of having through a converter each time, uh, that would be a great improvement. So that's a very good convergence that, that's happening there. Uh, I presented also with my colleague, Alex Duga, uh, the result of, of an ongoing work at CBC on automating and scripting the deployment and operation of our new uh, IP facility. And uh, we're, we're doing it like as we build Montreal, but that will be a tool that will be very useful to future projects. Our, our Toronto colleague can benefit from really speeding up their deployment because we realize the complexity of those systems, the number of parameters when you start to uh, include all the IP parts, the networking parts, um, and to really get the, 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 the benefits of an IP facility and the flexibility you want to achieve, uh, you need to be able to uh, to have a rock solid way of of uh, deploying and, and making change to your system. So we're basically applying techniques that are used for big data centers, uh, tools like Ansible, Jenkins. Um, so we we copy a little bit the, these workflows and these methodologies and we apply it to um, broadcast media equipment. Um, but it's normal, I think, for many engineers to um, to do it with their hands first before going to script and automate everything. It's a bit like learning uh, to calculate before learning to use a calculator. Um, uh, so I think that will be a learning curve for our whole industry to start by doing it manually, but at some point you realize you want it to be uh, automatic or automated. And finally, um, the I cannot talk uh, I cannot not talk about the live production in the cloud. Uh, I, I was I was feeling I had a couple of years uh, waiting and, and working on the the on-site media over IP um, and the big project we have before this becomes serious. But actually, it's really becoming serious the live production in the cloud. Uh, the presence of the big provider at the conference, uh, keynotes from Azure, Google. Uh, I, I happen to be in a roundtable led by AWS. Uh, it's amazing the speed this is growing. Uh, a lot of the broadcast vendors already are proposing solutions using those cloud providers for live production, and it's it's amazing what it can do. Um, AWS launch a, a CDI, so a, a an uncompressed video transport within their data center. Uh, so this will certainly open up um, the possibilities for for live application, and I'm sure the others will will follow uh, and offer uh, similar uh, possibilities. Um, so I, I cannot wait for two more years to uh, start looking at these um, solution. I think it's coming uh, very, very fast. So I think that was more or less, uh, or maybe I abuse a bit of the time. So uh, I will stop here for now. Thank you. All right, thanks, Felix. So I'm just gonna share my screen. You can click to the next slide for the bias. Sure, sure. Yep. Can you see that one? Yep. Thank you. No problem. So take it away, Sylvia. Thank you. Thanks, Felix, and welcome, Jeff. Jeff Moore is the Executive Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer, and Vice Chair of the, of the Board of Directors of Ross Video, a global leader in live video production solutions for broadcast, sports, entertainment, legislative, worship, and corporate uh, facilities. Jeff is responsible for day-to-day -day business execution, managing sales, marketing, and production, product management, while contributing to the executive team strategy and vision of the company. Joining Ross in 1997, Jeff has been integrally involved in the company's dramatic rise from a small 50-person niche company to a premier player in live video production technology with a global presence. He has helped to build the Roth video team and culture 
that have forged many new corporate relationships with customers and business partners, dramatically expanding Roth's market share worldwide. Jeff has over 30 years of experience in the broadcast and production industries with broad knowledge of Roth's product line, industry technology, and customer applications. Jeff began his career in broadcast in the engineering group of Chum Television, working closely with the manager of engineering on the complete redesign and move of City TV and Much Music to a groundbreaking new facility. Before joining Ross Video, he spent 14 years in Toronto where he enjoyed a career of increasing scope and responsibility. He worked for Ascar Technologies, managing broadcast design and installation projects, Sony as broadcast account manager, BTS as a regional sales manager, Acura as a regional sales manager, and Tektronix BMD, the Grass Valley Group, as Canadian National Business Manager. Jeff holds an executive MBA from the University of Ottawa and graduated with honors from the Broadcast Engineering Technology Program at State, Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. Jeff was raised in Canada's north in Whitehorse, Yukon. He enjoys hiking, playing hockey, traveling, and spending time with his family. Fun fact about Jeff, a few years ago, he and his son completed the Yukon River Quest, the world's longest annual canoe race, and they didn't come last. Well done, Jeff, and welcome. Okay, thanks, Sylvia. So uh, I think Craig has to hand control over to me here. Okay, so my deck should be visible. So general comments on the conference. Uh, I thought it was great. I thought it was actually a very good alternative to uh, meeting in person, which we couldn't do. And um, usually every year I've got to make a decision to either go or not go, and it's binary. And if I'm there, I get a chance to, to see everything or see a lot of what's going on. And if I don't, uh, then I miss it completely. So uh, this year was great because I kind of halfway attended. So I was able to jump in and out of things. And I like the kind of nonlinear nature of it. Um, I thought the papers were great, uh, very high quality. Uh, the uh, average length is very good. I, I, I actually liked having access to the videos and uh, being able to, um, one of the things I would do is run, uh, run them at one and a half times play speed and get through the content quicker. It was something maybe I already knew, uh, but then I could slow it down um, if I needed to or, or stop it completely if I got interrupted or wanted to take some notes or something. So, uh, so I thought the papers were really good. Uh, the portal I found took a little getting used to, but once I figured it out, it was okay. And uh, not much networking. So that was basically two things I get out of SMPTE. Uh, one of them is the papers and the other one's the networking uh, at the SMPTE conference anyway. And, and not so much on that. Maybe that's partly on me because I wasn't uh, you know, sort of participating live quite as, as much as I was um, non-live in, in evenings and on weekends and so on. So, um, and thank you, Barbara, for extending the, uh, the paper uh, availability to the end of the month, because there's a few in there that I didn't have a chance to watch, I'll get back into. Uh, one of the highlights for me, of course, was the online gala, uh, which was very well produced. And uh, John Ross being presented with his, his honorary um, SIMPTE membership, so that was pretty cool. So a couple things that, I'll uh, just go through a couple things that jumped out at me or I, I uh, watched and was interested in. So one was 8K. <laughs> Barbara mentioned this, like we don't have enough pixels already. Uh, so 8K, for those of you that uh, haven't been exposed to it yet, is four times as much as 4K. So it's uh, the formats for television are 7680 by 4320, uh, or in cinema, which of course always has to have their own flavor of things, is 8182 by 4320. So a lot of pixels. Um, uh, fortunately, the, uh, the color gamma and HDR considerations are very much the same as with, uh, with 4K UHD, which uh, we've we're already have gone through or are going through. Uh, connectivity is, is obviously a big deal. Uncompressed, it's, it's uh, you know, depending on how you look at it, it's 48 kilo, uh, gigabits per second, 48 gigabits per second. Um, and you can achieve connectivity in various ways. So um, quad link 12 gig SDI. Is, uh, is one of the primary methods for interconnecting 8K. 
uh, now, and uh, that, that allows us to do uncompressed at 60 frames per second. Uh, but there's also um, ways to move it across uh, SMPTE 2110 uh, IP and uh, with compression uh, JPEG XS as an example for that. There's a new HDMI standard 2.1 uh, that uh, is a way to interconnect with displays from set-top boxes or other future devices that uh, uh, that may come up, and uh, that gives us 8K at 60 frames as well. And then, of course, uh, streaming for OTT. Um, there's a codec called AV1 that uh, is uh, uh, baked into browsers now, and uh, smart TVs. Some smart TVs actually have hardware decoding for the AV1 uh, codec. Now, so eight, the 8K Association, I had no idea there was an 8K Association, but why not, right? So there is, uh, their job is to educate consumers and professionals on 8K and encourage the expansion of the 8K ecosystem. There's their website, or you can just Google them. Uh, Samsung, Tencent, and IMAX are uh, uh, some of the founding members of the 8K Association. Uh, here's a little bit about what's going on in technology. There's actually a growing uh, array of, of uh, technology available for 8K. There are 8K uh, displays out there, TV sets uh, that you can go to your local you know, Best Buy or other uh, store. And I've noticed that both Samsung and LG for less than $3,000 Canadian now, you can get yourself an 8K uh, television set. Not much to watch, to watch on it yet, but uh, you'll be able to get those pixels. Uh, Intel uh, participated in one of the papers, and uh, they're working on enabling technologies. So they have a Tiger Lake um, uh, system on a chip, a CPU-GPU combination that has 8K decode technology built into it, and uh, 8K display driver uh, uh, capability built into it as well. Uh, cameras on the market, there's both uh, film and broadcast cameras, uh, RED, ARRI, and Sony being some of the, the manufacturers. Uh, software tools available uh, for editing and so on, and um, uh, some early theater projector uh, projectors being shown shown as well. So, uh, although they're, they're, to my knowledge, there aren't really um, uh, too many theaters out there that are uh, equipped with 8K yet. Uh, one of the uh, so a couple of use cases that they're promoting for 8K, like why? Um, so OTT delivery is one, and uh, YouTube uh, has 8K content on it now. Uh, which they uh, make available for streaming. There's lots of really beautiful stuff on there if you want, want to go have a look. Um, cinema production, uh, digital effects, and digital signage. Of course, digital signage has lots of pixels to drive, so uh, 8K can potentially lend itself to that. And uh, it's starting to be used in film, film style production. A number of uh, more and more uh, films are shooting in 8K and and uh, there's this concept of 8K uh, content capture in finish. So you capture your content in 8K, that protects for the future, and finish in 8K, master in 8K, which uh, uh, apparently looks better when down converted to 4K because of the, the, the higher resolution uh, inherently that's there through the production process. And uh, one of the other things is, is to get more latitude in post. So to be able to shoot wide and then punch into the frame and uh, uh, give you more options later for framing, uh, or a little more forgiveness. And um, one of the things that they pointed out is that Getty Images and Adobe Stock are asking for 8K content now to try and build up their, their portfolios for, uh, uh, to be able to offer content to, to the features. A couple things, other things, and uh, Felix has already mentioned these, so I won't dwell on them, but um, uh, NMOS, uh, uh, Jed Deem from Nextera did a great uh, overview of uh, where things are at with with uh, with NMOS. Uh, and my, I guess my statement on this is, we're, feels like we're almost there. Like uh, this has finally evolved into a, a practical set of protocols for IP facility control. And a lot of the, the uh, we've been, a lot of the industry has been waiting for this. Uh, we haven't had it, so a lot of the um, implementations uh, of IP have been more proprietary in nature in terms of the uh, protocols that have been used. And the EBU back in the summertime um, mandated the, uh, the use of the NMOS protocols in, uh, in deployments of IP um, with their members. So that's an interesting move. And that means that, of course, manufacturers like us will, uh, we're on board, don't worry. But we'll have to support um, NMOS, and that means we'll get a more 
uh, kind of plug and play ecosystem going out there. The other things uh, that uh, Felix touched on as well was IPMX, which is uh, which is a, a kind of a parallel uh, evolution of the Ames roadmap that's targeted at an open specification for a pro AV to move video around over IP. So it's the only open spec, I think, for uh, pro AV out, uh, out there. Um, and it's quite different. So there, there's, there's a couple of things that uh, are a number of things that are relaxed on it, I guess. Uh, so one is it can tolerate asynchronous sources because often in pro AV environments, we don't have Genlock running around. We don't have a way to lock sources. We don't need uh, PTP. So it can run over less exotic networks. Um, it's uh, JPEG access compression is, uh, is, is part of the requirement. And that means we can run over modest, more modest networking environments like one, two and a half or 10 gig. I didn't really know about two and a half. Uh, gig networks did you because uh, apparently this is a new thing on uh, all intel chips that have shipped in the last year is two and a half gig networking you get for free over cat 5e cable so that um uh that means that uh as this stuff gets into uh, networking products a lot of laptops and and uh, desktop computers will be equipped with it will have another option to move video around over those networks a little faster and one of the other big things is uh, forward error correction instead of 2022-7. Uh, 2022-7, of course, means that we have two entire IP infrastructures to move signals uh, between point A and point B, just in case packets get lost. We've got that backup, that backup route. Well, um, instead of doing that, uh, IPMX uh, deploys uh, forward error correction. So those are some of the big things. I think there's there's it's early days still uh, with that. Uh, it's coming together, but uh, I think there's some interesting promise there for um, you know non uh, high end broadcast applications that we'll probably end up using in broadcast and production applications as well. Uh, other stuff in the cloud. Um, Felix uh, mentioned uh, some of the big players. One of them was Microsoft Azure. It was interesting as they presented their uh, media services framework. Um, so they're starting to figure out basically set how to build a better cloud environment for uh, media production and what are the needs of uh, you know the industry and, and customers in the industry. And so they're embarking down that path. And, uh, and then the, the video services forum is uh, working on uh, ground to cloud and cloud to ground uh, video standards for moving video over IP back and forth. And, uh, and uh, RIST is part of that, the real-time uh, internet stream transport uh, protocol. And there's a, there were a good series of papers on that. So those are the, I guess, the key uh, observations I had on. I'll turn things back to uh, whoever is got control now. Uh, so Sylvia, I'm going to get you to, um, I'm going to move the slide forward. And if you can introduce, uh, Jim, that would be uh, great. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for your perspective on that, and welcome, Jim. Uh, Jim's key accomplishments at Rogers started with Rogers Sports and Media's successful launch of UHD sports coverage in 2016. Jim is currently assisting with Rogers foray into all things IP with an IP-based modernized broadcast center launched in 2018 and is currently looking into IP options that support production applications. Jim is also currently supporting their Rogers RTV uh, team to deploy an upgraded MCR facility for Rogers Television in York Mills. Starting as a technical consultant project lead, Jim was and is involved with Rogers post-production modernization project with the launch of Sportsnet News Editing System replacement in 2019 and the Pivotal Media Supply Chain and Workflows project launched this year. Now full-time, these efforts continue in the role of Strategic Advisor Media. Prior to Rogers, Jim was at Bell Media, CTV as Senior Director, TV Engineer, Planning Projects and Network, which included managing the project groups responsible for capital budgets and deploying all, all the good stuff needed to make and distribute content. 
Other key past projects include the Vancouver and London Olympics, broadcast center and venue builds, and similarly for the Centennial Olympic Games in Atlanta, from which, from which Jim is proud recipient of a sports Emmy, video engineer. Jim is a professional engineer and member of Cinti and the IEEE. All right, Jim, all yours. Thank you so okay, much. Jim, I'm going to make you a presenter. Okay, okay. And that should uh, happen. There you go. Hey, everyone can see everything. Let me see if I can get uh, to slideshow mode. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Good, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, I attended as well. Um, you know, it was an interesting uh, venue, to say the least, being virtual. Uh, you know, you've seen these slide sets already in terms of the layout. Um, it was very, very intuitive. Um, it was laid out, easy to navigate. You know, as Jeff said, once you got to know, know how, um, uh, obviously it mimics a convention center, so it makes it easy to get around since those who are you know, used to working or attending conferences can do so. Um, I like the idea of setting up your agenda, uh, you know, in versus of a paper schedule. And uh, the fact that most of the sessions are recorded and, you know, as mentioned previously, you know, with VOD type controls, you can go back and, you know, see the events you had conflicts with or, you know, skip to sections in the papers you want to see. Um, another very interesting point I found on the slides, I think on day two, was the ability you could actually download the majority of the papers that were presented. You don't get the audio, but you can get the papers. That was very helpful. Um, I found, uh, you know, in terms of accommodations and meals, they're very home-like. Um, the timing was interesting as well. It was a very long day. The first day was from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, the timing was, you know, GMT. Um, and unlike normal conferences, you don't get the opportunity to put in your 20,000 steps for the day. Um, so what did I find of interest? You know, I, I look at a diversity of different types of papers and topics. You know, a lot of topics that we, you know, do work with at uh, Rogers Sports and Media and others that are, you know, coming down the pipe. Um, HDR and color space related issues, you know, as we mentioned, you know, we, we started down the UHD HDR path back in 2015. We're still exploring HDR. We've been UHD for years. Um, 2110 standards we adopted in 2018 with our launch of our master controls and infrastructure to support that. Um, Codex, uh, again, being a, a large uh, broadcaster, we also have a lot of digital businesses and a lot of different distribution ch channels. Um, again, we're looking at workflow tools, AI, machine learning, and, you know, alternate forms of content. Uh, immersive, te immersive technology was interesting and consumer trends. Um, so from an HDR perspective, I, I found some papers that were interesting on talking about still the challenges of the multiple color spaces you have to work with. And another interesting paper I found was on, you know, the, the, what is the appropriate reference monitor to use? Um, you know, depending on the type of monitor, not all monitors support the same color space that you might be working in. And the monitors don't necessarily represent the viewing audience or the environments that the viewers are uh, consuming your content. So working on a, um, a representative uh, mastering monitor was a, you know, an interesting paper and a, a topic to pursue. Uh, again, standards and trends were talked about, um, you know, obviously, you know, many continued conversations around 2110, you know, becoming the standard for new developments uh, and new deployments. Um, standards and best practices were discussed in multiple papers and the guidelines of, you know, EBU tech paper 3371 was an excellent guide. Uh, AMOP, you know, presenting their uh, overviews as well. The interop test documented under JTNM. Um, you know, I guess one one thing I, I did hear, you know, from from manufact from manufacturers was that there's a, a move towards uh, supporting uh, AMWA, but there's still a, there's still a bit of real world involved where 
Um, not all the device characteristics can be supported under a common set of standards. So there's a bit of uniqueness in products that need to be controlled. So they still see a bit of a need to, you know, continue to support APIs and other protocols such as Amber Plus. And architecture of choice, leak spine architecture seems to be very prevalent. Um, on a Kodak front, uh, 8K, I sat through some of the 8K papers as well. Uh, it doesn't work well over a LAN given the, uh, you know, the 48 gigabits per second uh, transfer speeds required. Um, you know, I guess if you can afford to buy a, a native 100 gig per port switch, that could resolve that problem. Um, but the challenge is like, you know, they were looking at JPEG XS uh, under, you know, 70 2020 2110-22 with, you know, about eight to one to 10 to one compression so that they could fit these, uh, streams within a 10k a 10 gig uh, connection on a lower cost switch i guess the challenge there is that it was still a bit of a poc and it was shown on uh software very high-end workstations doing the compression because the uh it hasn't yet been deployed in hardware you know for working within a, a LAN environment it does at the edge for you know for transport but not necessarily in the in the core um, one of the interesting things I noted that was pointed out in more than one paper was um, for 8K, and I'm assuming you can do the same for 4K, is that if there's bandwidth constraints, uh, then the nature of the codec allows the decoding at lower resolution. So an 8K native content can be decoded at 4K or HD, you know, which is I thought was an interesting feature. Um, in terms of tools, there was a lot of papers around different types of tools around AI, machine learning, um, and some of the papers were talking about deploying these tools to basically automate menial tasks. And, uh, you know, there was software defined workflows, automation, real time engines, you know, that can all be deployed to assist production again to make life easier. Um, there was a, a topic on, you know, high performance workstations, you know, we, they can do almost anything. Um, you know, there were still limitations in some of the existing workstations today in terms of how compute access as local memory and storage. So there's, you know, some um, workstations being re-architected to built around some of the architects, architecture originally deployed on the craze. And another, you know, the, from an AI perspective, SEMPTI and the Entertainment Technology Center Task Force are working on standards for AI as well, which I thought was very interesting. And on the immersive tech front, um, you know, one paper they were talking about immersive audio and uh, a lot of, you know, uh, production houses are working with, uh, you know, 5.1 or stereo and, you know, they do, they produce a lot of content and then they go back and discover, oh, can we do it immersive? And then they try to remix it in immersive and it becomes very challenging. So, you know, with, the development of you know standards uh, under for immersive audio, they're suggesting plan for and design uh, for immersive from day one, regardless if you have a customer today or not, because um, it's a lot easier to do immersive and then uh, deliver in current day deliverable standards 5.1 or stereo as needed. And this way, at least you can build your inventory of assets that you can monetize later on without the need to go back. Right. And as I mentioned, you know, there's a SEMPTI standard as well around immersive audio bit rates, you know, you know, and also working under IMF and DCP. Another interesting paper I saw was on uh, um, light fields and stages, which basically gives a, uh, a 360 degrees 3D uh, surround lighting environment that um, when you're shooting in a virtual space, you can change the lighting effects um, so that the, the actors look like they're more present in the, in the true, in the true uh, scenery of which the uh, production's being based. Um, some of the challenges they learned for that environment is that the, uh, the LED fixtures on early on deployments, the color spectrum weren't wide enough to represent or match between scenes or with uh, computer rendered images. So, uh, you know, skin tones were off, et cetera. So they've, they've started working on, you know, better color fixtures to fill in the spectrum. 
And then consumer trends, when you know, it was one or two papers talking about consumer trends, um, you know, around uh, large panel displays, the demise of LCD panels, uh, something they talked about called the crystal cycle, which is kind of like the supply demand cycle. There's this demand, so you increase supply, then you oversupply, then you have under demand. So the prices fluctuate in a cycle based on demand and supply. Uh, the trend for the types of panels they're talking about is, you know, OLEDs will not go away, QLED will probably stay, then there's new variations, what, you know, called QD, OLED, and micro LED. Um, China has become the, you know, the number one panel manufacturer in the world, but, you know, due to tariffs and other political issues, uh, there is a trend to move manufacturing to India potentially. Uh, in terms of the manufacturers, um, Samsung, LG, TCL are big drivers. And in terms of content, COVID has driven many people to, you know, increase their consumption of streaming services. Um, All-time records being set for VOD consumption, uh, more premium contents available to these consumers. Um, an interesting one presenter also commented about the... Um, um, smart TVs and uh, streaming apps and set-top boxes in that they don't see the demise of set-top boxes or external players um, because they tend to be a low cost, um, upgradable, flexible, or replaceable. Well, it's not likely you're going to change your smart TV because your streaming engines or software hasn't changed in a few years. So they, they see kind of a potential both surviving over time. Again, SVOD is a big winner. 50% um, of um, the viewing time uh, is occupied by OTT content, uh, particularly on the younger, youngest users they've polled. Um, and it was interesting that some of the biggest uh, services or the two biggest services worldwide are, you know, held by either Netflix or Prime Video in many markets, not all. In other markets, there's specialized uh, video services, China, for example. Another comment was an observation of there's so many streaming services now, they're calling them streaming clutter. So there's a need for more um, aggregation of the services. Uh, Esports. Esports was mentioned. Um, it's an interesting, uh, um, it's kind of like a hybrid of gaming, um, uh, remote production, OTT, and you know every problem and challenge associated with all of those. Um, you know, the industry has, you know, you know, a need for low latency codecs, but there's other, there's other um, producers that are, you know, spending money and doing 2110. You know, there's also, you know, the use of professional mobile trucks is still producing the best quality. Um, the players tend to be distributed geographically. Production staff can be distributed geographically, you know, uh, with centralized processing, which could be on-prem cloud or hybrid. Um, there's a lot of networking challenges, but being geographically, geographically distributed, you can have players at home, which have poor SLAs and you know, with their bandwidth into their houses. Businesses can do better, you know, with better SLAs. Um, the latency and the compression and the quality of the video, depending on the network source, could vary. So, you know, your production still has to be professional production, so you got to handle a variety of different uh, um, media streams, different latencies, etc. Um, audio is a challenge um, in this environment as well, particularly IFBs. You know, one of the things they did learn also is that, you know, because it's a worldwide event, it's, you know, English is not necessarily the language spoken everywhere. So they got to support multiple language channels. And um, one of the things they also discovered was that, you know, rather than trying to, you know, force you know traditional tools into this market let's take advantage of the tools that exist so some of the communication tools that are used day to day by gamers you know like discord teamspeak can also be used for production support um it's also a mix of you know hardware and software deployable services in this environment such as microservices and the big challenge is it's still a production so you still got to time align all the remote content so how that's done in software and other methods is uh, a challenge, but it's doable. Um, things I found cool, uh, one of the papers I spent was called The Science to Create the Magic, which was um, 
from Disney, Disney Research. Um, it's a, you know, division, a research engineering division of, of Disney that works in collaboration with universities around the world. Um, you know, they, some of the things they showed were, were quite amazing, actually, you know, like digital humans, you know, with facial expressions and emotions. And, uh, you know, you, you've seen them in some of the movies where in Star Trek, they bring back, you know, long dead actors and, and have them participate in the movie. And, you know, they're generating humans, you know, that don't exist for acting. So that was interesting. Um, AI and machine learning is also being used a lot. And one of the things I thought was interesting is that we're talking about 8K and uh, I've seen demonstrations, you know, at this uh, SEMPTI and I've also seen it after the fact where you take a low res image and using AI, AI up reses the image and the up res image looks as good as the 4K or 8K. Can you imagine having that chip in your TV set? Well, in fact, it does exist today in your NVIDIA Shield technology, which does AI up conversions. You know, I saw side by side conversions of an 8K, um, you know, HD, SD images in the 720p image. And in the, in the original image where they shot at high resolution, you couldn't read some of the signage. But the AI actually figured out what the wording was in the signage and regenerated the letters. So it was like, it didn't exist in the original shot, but it existed in the up versions, which I thought was rather amazing. Um, another thing that AI has been used for is denoising de pictures. So uh, part of the normal production process and to make the images look better. Um, other areas I saw, you know, streaming. Streaming is becoming, you know, I said over 50% of the viewing time is on streaming, um, but we still don't quite have the quality of experiences we get from linear, but people are working at resolving that. Like today, you know, the latency end to end in the streaming environment is like 20 to 30 seconds, but there's technical initiatives underway now to reduce that to say five seconds. So it's getting much closer to, uh, to linear distributions. The IETF is also working on a standard to help reduce chatter in the network. Most, you know, most client apps and software for OTT do a lot of chatter with the servers. Um, and they're thinking of, you know, a concept of let's, let's reduce the chatter in the network uh, outside the home by um, having an aggregator in the house or a gateway in the house, which allows multiple clients, connected clients in the house to communicate with the gateway and the gateway handles it efficiently to the network. Um, another, you know, another note, 70% of internet traffic is streaming video. Cloud was mentioned, hybrid cloud was mentioned. Um, uh, working from home, uh, working from home and working distance was common. One, one thing I found was a paper by a lot of audio professionals. They seemed to be, they were well prepared to work from home because many of them had their own home studios. So, you know, I saw a panel on that and they didn't seem, it was just part of day-to-day -day business for them, just working from home. Another interesting paper was on Sinclair. Sinclair has eight plus markets that have gone ATS3 now over the air. And one of the business opportunities that they're exploring is using it for data distribution to compete with 5G. So, and they're in a commercial venture with a company called BitPath to explore that opportunity. So that's, Quickly, what I learned and saw in my, you know, time-sharing days, you know, as, as Jeff mentioned, you know, I started at 10 in the morning watching papers and then went to 10 at night and filled in the gaps doing replays and, you know, and also attended my day-to-day -day, uh, work meetings while <laughs> doing the same. So that's one disadvantage doing it remotely. You still have to work. So at any rate, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. So Sylvia, if you can uh, I'll move over to this. Right. So thank you, Jim, and welcome, Paul. Paul Chapman has worked in the video and post-production industry in Los Angeles for over 30 years. BSc in honors in with his honors in computers and cybernetics from the University of Kent, Canterbury. During the first 15 years, he worked as telecine engineer and director of engineering at Rank Sintel Unimedia Complete Post and Unitel Video. He worked at Photochem from 1996 to 2017, initially as a chief engineer, then a senior 
Vice President of Technology, currently at SIM in Hollywood as VP Engineer and Technology, responsible for running an engineering team supporting operations in the Hollywood facility and choosing technology for the facility. Past MT Governor, current board member of both HPA and SCTE. Welcome, Paul, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody from uh, Southern California. That's one of the benefits of this whole um, world, I guess, is the, the ability to do this thing completely virtually. And of course, with the conference here, um, that's that, you know, the conference, in, our, in the SMPTE conference, that was definitely the case. Um, I, I definitely enjoyed the conference. Um, I think a lot of you have already covered a lot of what I was going to mention. I don't need to go over the same ground again, but um, you know, I, I thought the video video presentations were okay. It was definitely enjoying the uh, ability to go at one and a half speed for a few few of them because it really made it more watchable. You could skip through to the bits that you really wanted to learn about. Um, I, there was a little bit of a mix up, I guess, at the beginning with the you know the whole timing of watching the presentations and then uh, uh, going to the Q and A for the for the, um, the the presentations, but they got that sorted out pretty quick. Um, let's see the I, I actually enjoyed the roundtables the best of all. I did a couple of roundtables and I thought that was the best you, we could seem to be able to do for the social interaction part. I really missed that. I uh, I could have done it with a lot more of that in terms of just finding people. It was very hard to find people, very hard to, I didn't really have much success trying to get in touch with anybody. And the same problem, I think, with the exhibit halls as well. It was hard to find people who are actually there and you're able to talk to. I left a few messages and things and, you know, hopefully it'll come, you know, come together. Um, uh, you know, I think that uh, these are things that we're all learning. I'm actually on the on you know as I mentioned in the bio I'm in, involved in the HPA as well and we're going to be planning the uh, tech retreat which is also going to be virtual I'm very involved in the planning of that uh, that's going to be coming up in the middle of February it starts on the 15th of February and we're going to be using a slightly different platform but um, we're definitely aware of of some of the things that we've all learned from this conference and others we're actively looking at other conferences as well to see how they run what we what we learn from them. We're going to try and make it a little bit more live. Uh, we're going to have some more roundtable um, activities and more interaction. And, and of course, we are taking a, a account of all the different time zones as well, which is a, definitely a big benefit. Um, I think it's getting pretty late in Toronto there. Um, it's also getting close to the dinner hour here in LA. So I'll, I'm going to keep this fairly brief and hopefully leave a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the post-production world in Hollywood and so forth for the last uh, what, eight months now. Uh, we kind of started this whole thing in March and April. We had a crash course, I think, like most of you in uh, learning about remote editing and other remote aspects of working. Um, we were able to pretty much turn the facility around fairly quickly, learning a lot about uh, things like Evercast and Soho Netflix and RGS, HP RGS, um, and uh, other other tools like that. So now we've got a, a sim in Hollywood. We've got over a, well over well north of 140 odd plus people working remote now um, out of the facility. Um, we haven't really done much with color correction remote. It's you know we've, we're we're very fortunate that we have a safe building, and um, in Southern California we've been allowed to keep people coming into the building on a very limited basis. So the colorists come into the building pretty much in the back entrance. They go to their rooms. They never see anybody. They go home. It's, it's a pretty, you know, it's as safe as it can be, really. Um, we've been very fortunate as well in keeping um, very busy with a bunch of shows. Uh, we started with a big show back in um, April time frame uh, for the Global Citizen Organization, something called One World Together at Home. Uh, that was a huge production for us. And that was really just pretty much baptism by fire of learning how to do remote production, remote re review and approval. Um, some of you who went to the HPA earlier in the year, it seemed like it was like a century ago, but it was pretty much the last real in-person event that we got to do. But Barbara was very involved in that. She was starring role in Los Lederhosen. And, um, you know, we had a 
a, a real baptism of un, by fire of understanding how to do that with Los Lederhosen, and, and, and it was useful in that we learned a lot and we were able to put some of this stuff into practice very quickly. Um, one of the things I learned about was Frame IO, and we implemented that for for um, the Global Citizen for the One World, and then we moved on to a bunch of other shows after that. Um, I kind of made a list because it's hard to remember after all this time um, all these different shows we did. But we did, you know, Disney sing-alongs. We did uh, Dear Class of 2020 for the you know, American graduation season. Um, we did Vote or Miss Out, the Emmys, American Music Awards. I mean, these have all been done virtually. It's pretty amazing. And of course, the big one we did in August was the Democratic National Convention, which was done between our facility in Hollywood. Um, uh, a, a production operation in Milwaukee, uh, another one in Delaware, um, and also a, a small production uh, stage in Burbank. And that was really fascinating to watch how that was involved, and I was pretty involved in that one. So got to learn a lot about that. And, you know, something that, you know, coming from a background of film labs and very non-real-time post-production at Photochem for a long time, learning about live production, how to do things on the fly, how to pretty much... Um, you know, learn as you go along and, and do things very much quick turnaround. That's something that, um, you know, Sim, which was originally Chainsaw, learned how to do a long time ago. So, you know, it's been a been a very interesting year for me. And I mean, I, I know that a lot of people are having a really hard time. Of course, there's terrible statistics about the deaths in the country and you know, across the world. But, you know, it's those of us who are fortunate to stay working, I just really, you know, appreciate that. And I think it's it's a great learning experience for all of us. And I think it's also going to be one of these events that we look back on when it's all over and and go, wow, you know, we certainly advanced the industry with a lot of this. Um, you know, these things have happened before. We had the the earthquake in Japan where we kind of learned all about file-based workflows because we couldn't get videotape anymore, those kinds of things. We've had various writer strikes and other things going on that have, you know, caused us to, you know, change the way we do things. So, you know, this is going to be another one of those events as we go forward. And it's going to unfortunately be another year or so before we get back to to reality, I suspect. Um, those of you who have access to Apple TV, the Apple TV Plus platform, you might want to um, take a look at uh, the Mariah Carey Magical Christmas um, show. That was another one that we were very, very involved in. We pretty much put the whole thing together from a post standpoint, and that was done very much in the um, in the in the form of the Lost Lederhosen, but on a gigantic scale. That was done five cameras, virtual set, Unreal Engine. Um, with motion tracked cameras shooting the entire thing and then it was also shot in just for the extra little bit of fun and games it was shot in hdr as well so um, that was quite a journey that was uh, basically shot in october and in post-production all the way through up until about 10 days ago it just about landed on the platform it was uh, you know it was it was a challenge to get it all the way through but it was done uh, but certainly without the experience that we learned at, at HPA with Lost Lederhosen, and of course, attending some of the other conference events, I think this is where the, the conferences really help us out on this kind of stuff. Um, and so I, I had a couple of other comments I wanted to just throw out there for, for my other colleagues on the panel, um, mentioning about 8K production. We're not really seeing much 8K in Hollywood. We're seeing uh, very much like, you know, red 8K, which is really downsampled into to four. Um, so maybe that's happening in other parts of the world. I don't know. Um, and also the the comment about the 100 gig switches. Well, those are things actually we are pretty much using those things routinely now. And if you look around, you can find them relatively inexpensively. So, you know, the ability to actually move data around the facility at very high speeds is getting quite achievable. And a little tip for the wise, if, if you're looking to keep your fiber channel infrastructure going for a while longer, Look on the used market because the price is completely bottomed out of the fiber channel market. So um, you can get some really good used kit as well out there. But I didn't really have too much more to comment on. I thought that you know the the, the full conference was very well executed. I was a you know past co-chair of that, and it was really interesting to see how it was executed by others. You guys really pivoted and did a great job. Um, you know, I went to the the fellows lunch because I'm also a fellow, and I. You know, attending the fellowship presentation was fun. It was very, very different as well. Um, and it was nice to be able to invite other pe people who are not fellows into the into the event to see how it all happens as well behind the, you know, the secret handshake, uh, dark, smoky room where fellows all talk to each other. So that was fun as well. And the, I thought the, um, the you know, the, uh, the gala and stuff was really good. So, you know, it was a great experience all the way around. So kudos to Barbara 
and the team for doing that. I thought it was great. And I, I'd, I'd like to hand it back now and just, you know, just participate in a little bit of a, you know, hopefully Q and A for a bit, and, you know, get this thing going, you know, have a nice interactive discussion because I think there's a lot more to talk about, you know, as long as the time permits. Thanks, everybody. All right, thank you, uh, Paul. Um, yeah, talk about um, remote production and having a crash and going like, okay, what's happening and who's doing what and all I'm seeing is frozen screens. But the takeaway is you should have a, a device next to you that is a, a check of what's on air because I had no idea other than calling Craig and saying, are we still alive? Because I'm frozen. So, uh, and it's good to have a backup. So, if uh, I can get everybody to uh, from the panel to spark up their cameras and their audio, and then we can uh, go into um, the discussion of uh, of some of the questions that have come aboard. So. Um, Okay, so I've got a couple of questions here, and um, I guess this is more of a, a question, Barbara, for you and uh, possibly uh, Jeff because uh, of the involvement. What were some of the uh, larger challenges in the move to virtual? Hmm. Um, well, one of the comments was made here already was about live versus pre-produced, and uh, we thought long and hard about that. <laughs> and um, it's just uh, we we made the choice that it was better to have a high-quality, predictable presentation than the the. And we knew we were going to sacrifice something, so we did add in the Q and A, which was live with the speaker so hoping that that would um, make it feel more live um, I think the navigate you underestimate with all of us being online and all the time every day never mind zooming and whatnot uh, you underestimate that people don't um, pay attention to instructions <laughs> So interfaces have to be highly intuitive, and even when you do all the things you think you could do, um, you still have questions. So you, you, we always underestimate uh, that sort of aspect. Um, I think the hardest thing was just the whole decision tree of of what to do when and 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 the nervousness of whether it was going to come off or not. So I'm grateful that you all were, were kind um, and enjoyed it because you certainly didn't see all that sausage being made in the background. At least I hope you didn't. And, and I would say the last thing is, as I mentioned earlier, and maybe, maybe um, Jeff will mention this, the exhibition is just hard to do. And uh, the networking is hard. The exhibition is really hard to do So, in a virtual environment. Yes, I would uh, agree with that. I mean, it, it's not a big deal from a, a, I guess, a manufacturer's perspective to put something together and, and to have somebody staff the booth, but uh, the effectiveness just isn't quite the same. I mean, especially for Simpty, because Simpty, you have a booth because you got a place to stand and hang out with people, right, and chat right. with them as they come by. That's that's what we do, and and usually there are refreshments, and it's kind of a, there's a big social thing that goes on. We don't really exhibit equipment at Simpty so much. Maybe if there's something brand spanking new or something a little bit exotic that we want to show off, we'll have something there to uh, point to or talk about. So it's not really like, you know, let's say like NEB is, which is really all about the exhibits and maybe less about the papers, whereas Simpty is more, you know, papers and networking. So that was one thing I felt that, uh, that uh, I missed, but I did get a lot out of the papers and I found actually that, uh, you know, Felix mentioned this, that having the multi-track, you had to choose. I can either, get, I want to do these two papers and I can choose one or the other and, and now you can do both and uh, you can see them on your own on your own time schedule. So I think you've got a problem next year, Barbara, actually, because now you're going to have to decide, do I do one or the other or do I try and do both? That's going to be 
a bigger challenge trying to do both, right? Yeah, and the other the other thing that it's expensive to do these things if you want to do it well, and uh, hybrid is is basically doing two events at once. So we are definitely thinking long and hard about how we can have the best experience but we love the fact that we could get this global community more or less together and um yeah we have some decisions to make first there has to be a vaccine <laughs> yeah but i think uh, uh just one of the things that what we're finding even from at a section level is the more that you do the more that uh, people become aware. So I think the more virtual conferences you do, Barbara, the more that people will take that as a, a given. And I think your numbers will just increase accordingly. Yeah. Not sure what that will do for the, the real face-to-face -face numbers, because obviously that would be key as well to making it a success too. Yeah, it's gonna be hard on the restaurants and the hotels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I've got used to it as well. Like even our local Toronto section virtual meetings, I found them very good, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a letter from Pizza Pizza. <laughs> no more, no actually, more actually orders. Actually, I have one on that. I think even on this meeting, one thing I do miss is, you know, it's, it's nice to see the five of us, you know, looking at each other, but I do actually miss having everybody else, you know, being on camera and seeing them because, you know, I had to go through the list of people. I don't really know too many people in Toronto, but, you know, I know a few and I saw a few familiar names, but, you know, not seeing the faces is a, is a bit of a negative for me as well. Yeah. Not looking at it with the audience. Like when I'm presenting my paper, I had no idea if I was just talking to myself. <laughs> you know, it's challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess that's where the difference between go to uh, webinar meeting and Zoom all have different uh, components. Um, just another question here. Um, um, if you attended other virtual conferences, uh, what makes this one stand out or doesn't make it stand out? I know there have been some very positive thoughts. Uh, is there something that another conference might trump this one or is there something that, uh, and it's more of a, an information thing, I can say yeah. it's the best one I've ever attended. Yeah. Wow. Nice. That's it's very first nice to but it was very good. <laughs> the strength of the SMT conference is the program. Uh, there's, a, there's, you know, it's over three days. There's a lot of different papers. Uh, so I think this this sticks with, with virtual, uh, still a good program. Um, and, and you can choose, you can do your own track. So, um, program yeah a drive, a drive mm -hmm. like the fact you can schedule it like a real conference and it it drives you to stick with the papers right and but you don't have to worry about missing one right yeah uh, one of the one of the things that i i found uh advantageous is uh two things maybe a, a bit of a disadvantage is that when you are relocated into another city to attend the conference um you're there focused when you're when you're back virtually in your own space then if somebody calls up and says i got a gig i want you to come and help out mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're going like uh but i'm oh this is being recorded and sooner or later you you you're now disconnected and the fact uh barbara that you can go back in and see all of this stuff and the fact that now you've extended it to December 31st is just it's bonus because there is a lot of content to go through and um, you know I encourage anybody that didn't go I think there's a opportunity that people can sign up even though they didn't they go can. Barbara yes they can um, we are I, I think it's a 75% discount so people could still uh, if they didn't uh, register before they can still do that they have two weeks it's like, yeah. like jay so old still good that's right <laughs> i don't know what that is but yeah sure <laughs> so i i think somebody had commented uh i think uh, J uh, jim it might have been you uh or even uh uh paul um 
is the virtual aspect of conferences going to be a de facto going forward, do you think? Is this, because uh, I think we feel it here in the sections level, is that we're, we're hitting a lot more people than we ever could sitting in uh, Ryerson uh, uh, lecture hall. Yeah, well, I think uh, what it, from a business perspective, they're going to say, well, you didn't have to spend $2,000 last year going to a conference. Yeah. You know, you can, you can, you can work and go to the conference for a lot less. Yeah. No. Uh, true. True. And for your local section meetings, I would think part of your uh, success is also the fact that you can uh, do meet at Ryerson and have all that wonderful food and and can network. So uh, maybe in in your section environment, it's it's the it's a bit of a mixture of virtual and live. Um, one month maybe <laughs> virtual, one month maybe live. I I would think your boot camp. Sorry, your tech Toronto tech conference. I know you want to do it virtually next year, but do you think you always want to do it virtually? No, I yeah, go to Toronto local <laughs> automatically, right? So, so, so in, in in Ottawa pre-COVID, we uh, we'd meet in person and then we'd stream the the events as well online. So we streamed it on Facebook Live. We're a sub chapter of Montreal, so they got us right. got us started with this because they started it first. Um, and it works quite well. So people that um, want to show up and can make the time to navigate to wherever the, uh, you know, the event is, is that night, um, you know, they get the in-person experience and other people uh, either in the local area or, you know, from Montreal or Toronto that are interested in the topic can tune in and listen. So I think it's a pretty good way to go. We have a little streaming kit that we put together yeah, and a, uh, a couple of cameras we can, you know, do a couple of camera angles. We even have, you know, name keys for the for the presenters and things like that. Um, so that's another thing to consider is uh, is you know you don't have to choose one or the other. You can actually do both. It takes a little more work, and you need somebody that's committed to um, you know managing the technology. But I guess it's like you know my perception of it is that it's kind of not necessarily as live sometimes the recordings. Like they, they can record and then they're posted on a, our website. But I think if we can mix this format with uh, the live attendance when we can, I think it would be a great hybrid, right? So. Good point. Hey, Craig, I just want to uh, chime uh, in here uh, to see if you've um, been able to. Uh... Yeah, yeah, no questions from the floor at this point. Uh, oh, okay. I got some comments about cleaning my office, but other than that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's no comments, but so um, yeah, so and then we're about two, we're almost two and a half hours in at this point. So I, I think we're ready to move forward. If that's okay. good for you, Tony. Yeah. Cool. Alrighty. So let me. Uh, uh, anybody got any closing comments they want to uh, before I move on to the closing portion of my end comments? I just want to say thank you um, for all that you do in the section and Tony and your leadership. Uh, uh, Simpty is nothing without people like you who volunteer at the local level and, and bring 70 people together um, on this evening. So thank you and uh, I wish you all a very happy holiday. Well, thanks, uh, Barbara. And thanks everybody here, Barbara, Phil, Jeff. Jim and Paul, thank you very much for uh, spending time with us and making uh, a great, great uh, evening uh, talking about the uh, fall conference. And do remember that you can get into uh, um, partaking even though you didn't uh, didn't show up or weren't yes. allowed, allowed to uh, show up. Anyway. So I'm going to go into some closing comments, if uh, just a couple of uh, slides here. Um, post meeting, you're going to get a survey. Um, uh, the contest, uh, we have some prizes. We have uh, two membership, uh, one year memberships. We have two Simpty t-shirts, five <laughs> Starbucks gift cards, and five Simpty mugs. So, those Starbucks cards are $25 each. Oh, nice. Wow. Cool. Nice. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, the takeaway is you've, we're also looking for information as well. 
So you have to answer question one to four in order to be included. So uh, so we are putting a little bit of a, uh, a restriction on it. So hopefully, uh, um, yeah, you'll get the email tomorrow. I think it's at uh, 12 or 14 hours after the meeting closes. Uh, there is a recording of the meeting tonight and uh, something that we didn't ask, and I'll ask it live. If you have a concern of anything that was said and you want your section removed, just let us know, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, do a scissor cut. But other than that, there'll be a link or a URL link in the email that you're getting tomorrow as well. Uh, January's meeting is, um, now we've changed it a bit, uh, it is going to be COVID related, but it's going to be on the uh, bit of the broadcast, bit of the um, animation studio side, and uh, so that's happening in January. February, we're going to do uh, student focused again. And we felt that uh, last February was, uh, A, February is a good month because uh, the students are sometimes on reading week. And uh, it's a good uh, event to uh, focus on student topics. Uh, March, we might do, uh, or we're looking at doing a TSC 3.0 uh, with Humber College. And again, the technical conference that's going to happen in June. Now, um, yeah, the elections are coming. Uh, I did get an email from Home Office saying, where are your names? And we're going like, oops. So we, <laughs> we forgot that one. So if you want to get involved, uh, do reach out to us because we will be looking for three new managers and we're also looking for people to be on the committee to help us uh, decide on uh, the best people to put forward for the voting process. Um, to get a hold of us, you can go to the SEMPTI website. Uh, there is a become a friend if you want to see uh, information coming from the Toronto section and Facebook, Twitter, and email. Now, just back on the Facebook, if anybody in the uh, on the conference or on the uh, call here knows anything about Facebook, do reach out because we have a Facebook uh, problem, and trying to get a hold of Facebook is like pulling teeth. So. Um, it is something that the site is doing that we can't figure out. So if anybody wants to help us out, do reach out to us. Uh, last slide. Um, uh, do stay safe, stay well. Uh, we'll get over this COVID thing very soon, I hope. And we'll be doing what we did uh, last December. Have uh, food that is better than pizza and uh, we'll have uh, some good times. So here's the uh, final, final slide. So again, do enjoy uh, the uh, festive season. Happy holiday and the best to you and your family. And again, thank you very much, everybody, for participating. And that includes all the attendees. And again, Barbara, Jeff, Felix, Jim and Paul, thank you for uh, being part of this. I really, really, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Good night, Thanks, everyone. So. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Thanks, okay. Sylvia. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks. Bye.